So good evening and welcome to another episode of In the Vineyard With. Tonight for our fourth session dedicated to, us, to South Africa, my co-host, Kathy Van Zeil, Master of Wine, and myself are hosting a group of passionate winemakers that will tell us all about uh, Method Cup Classic, uh, MCC or Cup Classic in short now, uh, the traditional made uh, sparkling wines of South Africa. Um, our guests this evening are Peter Ferreira, Mr. Bubbles himself, cellar masters for 28 years in uh, Grand Beck. He's also the chairperson for the Cup Classic Producers Association, uh, Elunda Bassoon, award-winning cellar masters from uh, Stinberg Estate and um, from Constantia, I may add, just outside Cape Town, uh, Takwan van Arnim from Hot Cabriere, and Hank van Neekerk from uh, Paul René uh, MCC. Please feel free, uh, dear audience, to ask our guests any question. You will find at the bottom of the screen, if you search, if you touch the screen, you will find a, a button called chat, which I need to actually activate because mine is not activated yet, now it is. So when you click on chat, you will have the option to si send a, a question. Uh, you will find that it's uh, the, the default state is everyone. You can send messages to individual participants, but it is on everyone. So feel free to ask question we will draw a mixed case of Method Cup Classic at the end of the session um, to the person with the best or the most original uh, question. Kathy and myself will uh, uh, choose uh, the question. So uh, again, welcome everybody. And uh, uh, without further ado, I will start uh, asking the first questions. Uh, I will start with Peter, if he's back, yes, he's back with us. Um, Peter. MCC or Cup Classic in even shorter uh, uh, term. How can you describe uh, Cup Classic to people that uh, never heard or never tasted it in the current situation, in the current wine scene, the current uh, uh, wine scene worldwide? Uh, how would you describe it? Um, yeah, thank you, Moshe. The, it, it, to me, it's very clear in my mind that uh, Cup Classic. Uh, is always the better alternative if you don't want to do champagne. Uh, we are very fortunate in South Africa that we have beautiful weather conditions and that we have a beautiful consistency and a touch of sunshine that we can portray in our wine. So uh, uh, Cap Classique is completely unique, uh, although we follow the same principles as the Champenoise. Uh, it, the reference used to be Method Champenoise, but it, was, it became a restricted name and we had to find uh, an alternative. So uh, we developed the name in 1992, um, cup referring to the Cape where our grapes are grown, and I'm sure we'll be able to explain that with the map we will show. And then classic is the traditional classic way of producing it. So it's bottle fermented. And again, uh, it should be the better alternative if you don't want to do champagne. And um, yes, you mentioned 1992. Uh, when you read some textbooks, you hear about 1971. And um, obviously there are uh, references to, uh, not the name MCC, but uh, traditionally, spark traditionally made sparkling wine from the Cape from 1971. But uh, I have to say as a consumer, as a keen consumer, uh, the, the name is, or the, the um, awareness to the brand is very recent. I know that you uh, prepared uh, a presentation for us and wanted to show us uh, figures uh, relating to uh, how it became uh, more famous in recent years in relation to exports and plantings, yeah. etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before I, you 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 mentioned the uh, the map, so just before we go to your presentation, I wanted to uh, show just everybody just a bit of your orientation, just uh, where we are. Uh, I normally start the sessions uh, with that. It's uh, um, can everybody see what I'm pointing here? 
can you see that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, the four representatives, uh, we are um, the South Africa. I, I hope you don't need me to zoom out further, but I'll do a little bit. And then we'll uh, see Cape Town here uh, and Constantia Stinberg, just outside Constantia. We will uh, talk to Alunda in a minute. And then we have uh, uh, two uh, further, uh, what happened to these? Oh, here we go. The uh, hot cabrier from uh, uh, French Hook and um, the uh, Peter that is talking to us now is uh, Graham Beck uh, Winery. And last but not least, it's uh, the, why am I showing both? Hold on, just a minute. Yeah, Paul René, that is the furthest to the east. So I will uh, just, we will, might refer to this map again uh, at some point when we want to show variations or topography or individual vineyards. Uh, but uh, Peter, the stage is yours to uh, continue with uh, the talk about the emergence yeah. of MCC. Uh, yeah, just Moshe, just uh, prior to the tasting, it's really next year is a huge celebration for Cup to Seek. We are celebrating 50 years of Cup to Seek in South Africa and uh, uh, quite a visionary man, uh, Wim Franz Malan from Simonsach, which is a uh, family operated uh, winery out of Stellenbosch, was the first producer of uh, Cup to Seek. So, uh, I'm sure we will be able uh, to bring you much closer to the festivities uh, next year when we celebrate 50 years of Cup to Seek in South Africa. So I've prepared really just a, 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 a nice generic uh, introduction to... Um, I hope that Simon Sich uh, kept a bottle from the 1971 uh, vintage. <laughs> well, apparently, apparently the story goes that um, when Franz, when he did it, he thought it was so acidic and he, you know, it was made from Chenin Blanc that he sort of hid it away. And uh, the story goes about five years later, Johan Malan, the, the son, uh, walked into the cellar after school and he saw this bin of bottles lying with... Uh, with a crown cap on, and uh, he was very intrigued. And uh, yeah, then sort of Cap Classique was born out of that. So it's really interesting. It was made in 71, but sort of the mainstream of uh, Simon Sich started in 78. So uh, Cap Classique, it just means uh, the method is uh, bottle fermented. Uh, we have an association, and uh, this is going to be the uh, uh, the, the slides that will follow and um, at any time uh, yeah as uh, Moshe has said uh, use the chat box if you chat box if you want to make some questions so long so the introduction um, uh, cup classic quoted as the most vibrant category um, in South Africa uh, according to Jamie Good, who's a fantastic uh, South African ambassador for, uh, for wine. And uh, he comes on a sort of 18-month uh, stint with uh, Trev Ring. And, uh, you know, they do a collective cup classic tasting. So, uh, as I mentioned, the association was established in 92. Currently, we have 84 members, but it represents 92% uh, of the total uh, Cup Classic produced in South Africa. So um, the membership uh, produces about 9.2 million uh, bottles uh, out of uh, just over 10 million bottles. So Cup Classic is known to be the fastest growing category in South Africa and uh, currently it doubles up four and, four and a half years. Every four and a half years it doubles up. And, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, the queue for uh, the 50 year uh, celebrations. So watch uh, the, 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 the social media platforms and you will learn more about the festivities that is planned. I'm not gonna go through this because we do have a comprehensive website, but this is just our current 54, uh, 84 members. Of which some is tuned in, and definitely you'll learn a little bit more from my fellow uh, uh, producers. Uh, 
uh, there again, 71 France Milan, 50 year celebration next year. It became a synonym for the Metot Chambonoise, which means bottle fermented, sparkling wine. Uh, originally in 1992, there was only 14 members. Uh, today, according to the Sava statistics, there are about 200, just over 200 producers producing some Cap Classique. But if you look at the collective uh, membership, uh, I think we are fairly inclusive in terms of the volumes. So total production, 10.2 million, uh, and the members produce 92% uh, uh, of that. Um, it's interesting that the fruit, uh, and you'll hear the stories from the individual brands tonight, that the fruit is harvested from 36 different geographical areas. And um, uh, Cap Classique, 83% remains uh, in South Africa and only 17% is exported. This is just the growth uh, over the last 11 years. Uh, of the total producers, uh, according to service. So way back in 2008, uh, there was about 58 uh, members or producers, and today it's just on 200. Um, this is just to give you uh, a little bit more insight to the bottles produced versus versus that of a standard sparkling wine. So uh, blue is the Cap Classique uh, growth. And you can see there's been a very or significant change really came only as late as 2013 when we started to jump uh, quite nicely. And you can see the trend of sparkling wine. The orange line is definitely dramatically coming down. So at some point, I think, uh, Cap Classique will be more popular than the general impregnated uh, sparkling wine. Am I allowed to ask questions now or can I hold until later, Peter? Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to take a question. Okay, I was just looking at that previous slide where the gap is um, getting smaller and smaller between um, the impregnated sparkling wines and then the bottle fermented sparkling wines. Can you give us some idea in terms of cost of production? Roughly how much it costs to produce a bottle of sparkling wine, bottle fermented sparkling wine, and potentially also give us an indication of um, price to market or consumers recommended retailing price. Is that a hard one? No, I should have told you to hold that question, but oh, I, I okay, hold. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know what? Uh, let Let's be fair. If you look at a if you look at a carbonated sparkling wine, which is sparkling wine that is made in a in a pressure tank and it's bottled uh, into a bottle, you are using a bottle that needs to hold uh, at least uh, up to six bars of pressure you have a natural cork, you have a wire hood. So the cost is pretty much the same as that for Cap Classique. So, you know, sparkling wine is not that cheap to do, but where, where the difference for Cap, uh, Cap Classique comes in, it's more about the approach and the selection process, the handling of the fruit that it is whole bunch pressed. So there's so many more steps that goes into producing a cup to seek than that to a normal sparkling wine. So although the bottle is maybe the same, uh, the cork and wire is the same, you have added thing if you want to refer to cup to seek currently, you have to have the wine for a minimum period of nine months on the lees. So that product is virtually 12 to 15 months old before it gets into the market. And if we decide to make a normal sparkling wine, it could be in the market next week, you know, that type of thing. So uh, I think the, the route to market or the, the cost price to market, uh, yeah, it's, it's, both, it's both quite expensive. So uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm not beating around the bush, but I think it gives you some insights. 
And I think if you listen to my fellow winemakers tonight of the intrinsic values that really goes into Cap Classic, uh, uh, it is naturally going to be more expensive because so much more care goes in. Uh, you know, if you have to go back to 2008 when sparkling wine was flying out of the market, it was all the dregs in the cellar that they couldn't sell a still wine and they put some gas into it and it looked quite nice. But uh, uh, Cup Classique is a little bit different to that. Sorry for the interruption, Peter. You can move on. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. Peter, can I ask <laughs> a question? Peter? Yes. Peter, uh, those orange skyscrapers, do they include the, does it include the Petit Lanferlet category um, that doesn't go into a typical um, champagne cup of six bottle? Or was it, was it all um, sort of six or eight proper bottle and cork sparkling category? Uh, the, the blue line or the orange line? The previous slide, the orange one, where the orange was on top, yes. The sparkling, that sparkling category. Uh, yeah, now my computer doesn't want to... Showed that <clears throat> you you want that that one yes uh, yes so the orange does that include the petitland per lake category or is it um, no if you it it's, it's, it, yeah Hank it's a good question if you refer to sparkling wine as you can see how uh, it is uh, done through the star star statistics if it's sparkling wine it needs to conform to a minimum requirement of three bars of pressure which is the exact same pressure that is for any bottle fermented sparkling wine. So it excludes Perlet and lighter styles of sparkling. Uh, this is just to give you a feeling of uh, exports. Um, uh, Moshe was right. It's only really recently in the last five years that uh, Cap Classique has reached the international markets. But again, uh, you know, it's only 17% of total volume that goes out to, to uh, the international markets. You would therefore find uh, somebody like ourselves, Graham Beck. We have a ratio of a 50-50, 50 local, 50 export. But you might find that uh, my fellow colleagues, uh, their split is different. But that just gives you an idea. I'm not going to bore you with this. This is... Uh, this, uh, Information is available through Moshe, but uh, the UK is, our, is South Africa's number one cup classic uh, importer, followed by USA, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, and Japan, if we just take the top six. Um, and these are figures which is relevant. It's uh, 2019 versus 2020. And um, you can see the UK is growing... Uh, very healthily uh, in double digits. Uh, America is really battling. Sweden is related to tenders and not many tenders has come South African Cup Classic way. And then uh, there's a little bit of growth in the, the Netherlands and the rest of Europe. Well, the huge uh, uh, increase in Estonia of 24%. And, uh, uh, Liz just mentioned the, the fact that uh, France is not uh, really uh, on the map. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's a reason for France because the, you know, the French have you know, also so many other uh, different sparkling wines outside Champagne, you know, all the Cremants. So, um, you know, they, uh, but there is minuscule, you know, France will fall in the other countries, which is below Kenya on, on, on this list. There is a little bit of wine that, that does get to, to, to uh, France. But Estonia, obviously, it looks like a huge jump, but it's from a very small base. So, uh, but yeah, it's interesting to see. Um, viticulture, I'm just going to touch on it because you're going to hear more individual stories. Um, the diversity of the Western Cape is really diverse. And as we talked about, anything from 28 plus uh, geographical wards is represented by the, the producers. But you would find Paul, uh, Stellenbosch and Robertson to be the three most prominent uh, classic production areas. Uh, 
We have no restrictions on grape varietals, so any grape variety can be used for a classification of Cap Classique. Um, although we do prescribe, as an association, we do prescribe that uh, uh, members should be using Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and some Munia, which is the third variety out of Champagne. But obviously, we all uh, are. Um, committed to sustainable viticultural practices. We have a, a certification ruling um, on, our, uh, on our actual, um, there you can see the sticker. It is the integration and the sustainability uh, sticker that relates to audits. To be able to be, uh, you know, if you carry the sticker, then uh, you know you are sustainable. This is the map. Um, just to identify all the different wards. So this is the Western Cape, and pretty much this whole area, well over 95% of all grapes are produced in these geographical areas. We used to talk about regions, but now uh, they are breaking down the regions into much, much smaller demographics, which is really good and ideal. You can see uh, the current wards in the regions are now standing at 91. So. Moshe, I don't know if you want to touch on the map. No, but we can the, the, the map is fascinating because uh, we every time we we uh, do a session about uh, when South Africa we done uh, one just uh, on Stellenbosch Cabernet and we we found so many variations between the wards. So to talk about MCC from the entire country is fascinating to hear and we can just talk about the, the different words and the different regions and what they can bring into the mix, even if we just concentrate on the traditional grape varieties of uh, uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and maybe you know, Meunier, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it will be fascinating to hear. Maybe when we talk individually to the uh, grower, to the uh, cellar masters, we can yeah. hear. Uh, yeah a bit uh, uh, and um, yeah so this is just um, um, for somebody from outside even I think South Africans that are uh, making wine or consuming wines will find it um, intriguing but from outside it just um, just how do you convert that to the bottle that is in front of you to understand actually what's what's where it came from because the information is not there Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's um, the um, the information is not yet with us to yeah. to, to follow a certain part even of of uh, Pal or uh, uh, Stellenbosch. So, um, but we can touch. Yeah, on it, it we we can most probably individually touch on that. But uh, you know, remember this system has been born been born out of a very archaic uh, approach. You know, where, you know, if it was in one region, you can make a reference to the region. But now, as soon as you take one region and you take a little bit of grapes from another region, you can only call it Western Cape. So uh, these fights continue, but now, uh, you know, at least you have, where we haven't had in the past, we now have 91 different individual little uh, components that we can that we can refer to so uh, a little bit more th out of that in the individual stories this is just uh, to give you a breakdown of where our producers or where, where the, the majority lies obviously uh, 38 um, 38 percent of uh, Cap Classique comes from uh, 65 producers in Stellenbosch. You have Paul next, you have then Robertson, and then you have the smaller ones, which uh, is as far as the Northern Cape, uh, the Kleinkarua, Swartland, and obviously Franschuk with 14 uh, producers in there. So uh, just for interest. Vinification. Um, uh, we, it, 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 there's no control, but we do prescribe that uh, all members should be doing whole bunch uh, pressing, and you'll hear the individual stories on that as well. Uh, we allow stainless steel and uh, uh, wood fermentation and maturation. 
Uh, interesting thing is uh, that the legal requirement is nine months on the lease currently, but as from the vintage 2021, uh, it is moving to 12 months. So uh, we believe that is a step in the right direction um, to uh, make sure that we get much more yeast complexity into cup six. So from 2021 onwards, uh, the wines or cup to six that will be declared from the 21 vintage is 12 months uh, minimum on the lease. And then we have an annual base wine, which is a little bit like a peer review, but it's an open forum and we exchange some beautiful ideas to obviously always encourage uh, the quality of uh, Cap Classique. Uh, another requirement is a minimum of three bars of pressure, which I've mentioned before. And uh, there is definitely a white paper out that we do believe uh, we could most probably classify Cup Classic into different tiers, uh, but that is still work in progress. Next year's celebrations, 50 years, to keep that in mind. Stylistically, um, it's nothing different to that of Champagne. There is Blanc de Blanc styles, which means it's made only from white grapes. There's Blanc de Noir only from red grapes. You have normal blends, rosés, and a lot of wineries are developing their own prestige cuvées or wines that has uh, spent extra time on the lees. Um, and uh, a growing category for us, it's a sugar, sugar classification. It's the demi-sec category is coming uh, due to uh, the demographics of our main market. Um, but I'm sure we'll uh, talk about that as we taste uh, each other's wines. Our sugar levels is international ruled. So um, it is the exact same for Champagne, for Cava, for Francia Corta. Uh, it's the international ruling. So if you have any reference to Brut Nature or uh, Brut Zero, it has to be less than three grams. To have reference as extra Brut, less than six. Brut is below 12. Then you have a category called Extra Dry, which is 12 to 17. You have a Sec category, 17 to 32. And then Demi Sec, 32 to 50. And then your sweeter styles is 50 grams uh, uh, and above. That should look the other way. Then um, for those of you who are really interested, uh, if you go to the Cup Classic website, you will find uh, we have developed a membership for a Cup Classic community. It's really fun. Our manager of, of the association, Caroline, is, uh, is with us tonight. And she might just in the chat box put down her uh, email for you if, you if you really are keen to learn a little bit more about it. It's a little bit more like a, a VIP uh, membership where uh, you as an outsider who loves uh, bubbles uh, will have uh, a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, experience with a winemaker of a, uh, a member of the association. And uh, yeah, much more is available on the website and uh, you you just drop your uh, email to Caroline and she can give you more detail. And then we have a website. It's just kapsik.co.za. Um, just uh, we have a members page. We share uh, technical information on any technical aspects, either in the cellar or in the vineyard. And then whenever we have a collective tasting, all the tasting notes will appear for uh, a reference going forward. And then. Um, we have declared one September in South Africa as the, the International Cup Classic Day. So uh, those of you who are on social media, you'll start seeing it because we are three weeks away from uh, having our uh, International Cup Classic Day. There you have the details. So uh, I hope that gives you a good foundation to what the Cup Classic is about and uh, I'm sure by now we're all thirsty. Yes. Okay, so uh, 
Yes, we heard about, uh, and some of the questions, excellent questions. Thank you for the questions that were answered. Uh, thank you for answering them. Uh, whoever answered uh, to questions about harvesting, machine against versus uh, uh, hand uh, uh, harvesting. So we believe just for everybody to, if your chat box is not uh, open, that uh, it's uh, stipulated that the harvest should be manual and um, whole bunch press is uh, stipulated, I believe. Belunda, you uh, can confirm that, whole bunch. Uh, there's no specification about the type of press, unlike champagne, for instance, where it has to be uh, the cocard press uh, they can use in South Africa, whichever press they prefer. So we'll give Peter a, a bit of a rest. And uh, before I ask uh, more individual questions, I think we have uh, four wines that uh, we want to touch on and uh, four uh, growers that uh, will uh, highlight the stories of their uh, 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 estates and wines. I'll start with you, Linda, ladies first, and uh, Stinberg. And, uh, Yes, Kathy is showing us the Stinberg bottle, which I have here too, and the uh, Chardonnay. Um, so take us, tell us uh, first, Alunda, just a little bit about yourself, your background, why you're so passionate. I know you're passionate about sparkling wine and MCC, and what's in the glass? Yes, good evening. Thank you, Moshe, for the opportunity. Um, can I just check, am I sharing my screen with you? Can you guys see the presentation? Not yet. I think you need to double click on it. Okay. Oh, I will have it on mine. Oh, yeah, there you go. You've got it? Yes, there we are. We're with you in the cellar now. Okay. Let's get this done. Yes, so um, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of tonight's tasting. Um, for the last uh, little while of my winemaking career, yeah, um, I have to agree with you. Um, everything sparkling. Um, has been quite a, a, a passion for me. Um, but at the moment, um, I've been with Steenberg Vineyards for the last year, since June 2019. So um, please allow me a few moments to just uh, share some, some details about Steenberg Winery before we get to the wine itself. Um, I am holding thumbs that I will be able to actually share this nice little video with you. Moshe, you can just confirm whether you guys are seeing this. Yes, it will, it will play. Yes, there you go. Good. The
Well, you convinced me, Alunda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on, <laughs> I'm on the first plane. We just mentioned before in the map that you're the closest to, obviously, Cape Town, that is a massive um, tourist destination. And, but yes. uh, maybe I'll jump ahead and uh, uh, you will touch on the fact that Constantia is not known for, uh, uh, for growing grapes or MCC, some, but you will touch on it when you're ready. So take, take, it, take it from there. Sure. Thank you, Moshe. Uh, yes, we consider ourselves to be um, almost a, a, a city, city dwelling, a, a city farm city vineyard in, in Constantia, being 20 minutes um, from the International Cape Town Airport and 20 minutes out of the city centre. And um, I think these images uh, kind of portray what the, the message that Steenberg wants to bring the world in that Steenberg Farm and Steenberg Estate is, is more than just the winery, it's more than just the, the two exquisite restaurants that we have. It's more than the, the five-star um, golf estate and the golf course that we have on the, on the, on the premises. And, it's, and it also includes our, our beautiful five-star boutique um, hotel. So I think Steenberg as a brand represents um, everything that's aspirational and great about being in Cape Town, good food and good wine. Um, and uh, just to give you a quick background as to the significance of Steenberg Farm is, is the beautiful history that we have. Um, some of you might know that in um, the 1600s, the, the Dutch arrived um, together with Jan van Riebeek arrived at the Cape. And if we look at the history of our farm, it dates all the way back to 1682, when this piece of land was granted to a lady by the name of Katerina Ras, um, who arrived in the Cape from Germany. And uh, she, was, she was quite a formidable lady and lived quite an incredible history. Um, and when you come and visit Steenberg Estate, We'll tell you all about her significance and how we try and preserve the history and the heritage that she left for us. She was a fiercely independent lady. She survived four, four husbands. Um, she killed a lion in um, revenge of the death of her husband. And so she was daring and uncompromising and authentically true. Um, we consider her to be a pioneer of her time, considering the life of women in the 1600s. And, um, and so I think the Steenberg legacy and the Steenberg experience is all about being authentically true and representing the very special terroir that we're located in. So um, as you shared on the, the map previously, you can see right in the middle of, of the, the city of Cape Town, we have this beautiful um, wine valley called Constantia. And um, what's interesting about Constantia is that it seems to be registered as the oldest appellation in the new world, which I found fairly interesting. And, and then just if you have a look at the fact that Steenburg is uh, located approximately five kilometers from the False Bay coastline. It means that the Constantia Valley is considered to be one of the coolest climates um, of wines of origin of South Africa. And so we mostly focus in Constantia on white Bordeaux and red Bordeaux blends. So our um, most prominent uh, grape varietals are actually Sauvignon and Sauvignon Semillon blends, as well as Merlot and Red Bordeaux blends. So you wouldn't really um, consider this to be prime location for, for a, a, a fairly significant 
an important Method Cup Classic brand, which we like to believe we are. Um, and so that, that makes for an interesting little background. So um, just to, to further that uh, statement that I've just made, if we look at Steenberg macroclimate, we have a very mild temperature. Our warmest uh, months of the year is considered to be February, which is middle of harvesting season. And on average, that temperature is only 24 degrees Celsius, which is cool in comparison to other slightly warmer climates. We have that beautiful cool breeze from the ocean, which is five kilometers away. We have a very reliable winter rainfall, so fairly high in, cons um, in, in, in terms of, of some of the other more dry land areas. Um, and we have a good exposition to sunlight in summer. So on average, in comparison with uh, a well-known uh, area like Stellenbosch. Uh, Constantia and especially Steenberg will we have almost one and a half hours less of sunlight in summer, which is quite significant and that contributes usually to our, our cooler um, summer temperatures. And Lisa, sorry, and sorry, that would be mostly in the afternoon. When, absolutely. Um, because yes. you get, yeah. you're hidden from the setting sun by the mountain range. Absolutely, we're on the slopes of, of the Table Mountain range, and so that's in early afternoon, correct, um, Kathy? Then miso climate a little closer um, into looking into the vineyards. We have southeastern um, slopes. We have altitudes ranging from 60 meters to 160, and again, that proximity to the ocean. Um, and so for all these reasons, as I mentioned, Sauvignon Blanc and Bordeaux Reds um, are mostly uh, what we kind of our claim to fame in the Constantia Valley. And, and for Steenberg, um, we created a, a unique opportunity where in our younger Sauvignon Blanc vineyards that still need a little bit of time to grow and develop into our premium Sauvignon Blanc still wines, we've created an opportunity to um, produce a sparkling Sauvignon Blanc. And what makes it fairly unique in the sparkling category is that it's um, bottle fermented. So it's not a carbonated Sauvignon, it's bottle fermented because we believe that that adds to the quality of the pro pro um, product and also because our production environment is set up to produce our Blanc de Blanc and our Pinot Noir Cup Classique. And so we felt that um, that was almost the easier route to, to go rather than do a carbonated Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so what's interesting about the Steenberg Cup Classiques then is that our Chardonnay and Pinot Noir vineyards that we tried planting on the farm a few years ago did not initially thrive in our cooler climate because of the windy southeasterly conditions during the ripening season. And because of that, this, the decision was made to actually buy in grapes from other origins as uh, Robertson and Darling for our Cup Classiques. And then um, how do you, uh, you, you make the um, Cup Classique in the, vin in the cellar um, at Steenberg. So can you talk us through the, um, the harvest and the logistics of getting grapes from Robertson, which is, I suppose, a good two hours drive away, if not longer. And Absolutely. how do you protect the grapes and then bring them into the cellar to, to make the wines? Yeah, Kathy, that's a very important question. I think, um, I think most of the other guys on the panel tonight will agree that if you buy in grapes for Cap Classique and it's, it's not from your own farm, then the most important thing is to have a good relationship with your farmer and with your grape supplier. And so um, we're incredibly privileged to have a wonderful relationship with a long-term grape supplier from Robertson as well as Darling. And, um, these guys start harvesting, hand harvesting our grapes at the coolest morning temperatures while everyone else is still sleeping um, to make sure that those grapes arrive as early as possible. 
We, um, a lot of us these days, also because of climate change and because of the, the warmer summers, um, and again, with having great relations with these guys, um, they have the ability to actually also uh, cool and cool transport a lot of grapes between different wines of origin. So even if there's a lot of travel time needed, they take the greatest care to make sure that the grapes arrive nice and cool um, by using cooling facilities, cold storage, um, and even cold storage transport in some um, cases. So I guess it's all about having, having that relationship with your grape supplier. And then of course, processing on our side starts as early. And um, that means early evenings and we can go home early. So there's a little bit of a benefit there. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah long-standing and trustworthy relationships with good quality grape growers. And then can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, we're lucky enough to have the wine in the glass. I hope everybody else can just, has got a glass of sparkling in front of them and they can pretend it's Steenberg. If they were tasting um, Steenberg in their glass, what would you want them to, to taste, Yolinda? Yeah, um, I'd love to just quickly get to that slide, Kathy. Yeah, so so I think with with our Blanc de Blanc, which is important for us, is that oh gosh, let's see, there we go, back. Um, what's what's important to us is that. Um, this this label and packaging and and Blanc de Blanc from Steenberg has become um, quite significant and stand out in the South African category and I think it represents the the the, the most beautiful characteristics of a bottle fermented Chardonnay and um, in that it it shows you beautiful acidity and zestiness and all those beautiful citrusy limey characteristics from a Chardonnay but with um, with really nice uh, evolution and a little bit of um, bottle age and maturity on on the palate and the finish of the wine. I think the Blanc de Blanc category at the moment is quite trendy uh, well probably across the world but but most definitely um, within the, the South African category, Blanc de Blanc seems to be quite trendy. Um, and exactly for those reasons, I think people are enjoying the, the Chardonnay character that is showing from, from the fruit um, with the added little bit of and time and development in the bottle. So with our Chardonnay Blanc de Blanc, we try and have anything between 12, 12 to 18 months of aging. In the bottle before we go to market. We also produce the 1682 in a magnum and as most of us know magnums just drink better. They age better, they mature better, they stay fresh for longer and um, there's more to share between friends. I noticed on the on the label it's uh, it's um, stated Chardonnay not uh, Blanc de Blanc. Is that something that you think uh, one day will change? Um, I think that's an interesting question. I think in in some international categories, uh, Blanc de Blanc means something to the consumers, whereas I, I think at some point in the South African category, Chardonnay means more to local consumers. Um, uh, I think it's important to, to state that if we look at all the entities located on the farm itself, Steenberg sells almost 33% of its wine on this facility itself. Um, so people get to come and hear the stories, they get to come and experience the farm and all its entities. And um, so we sell a lot of our, 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 our SKUs and our products on the farm itself. And so export is really quite a small portion. I, I think we probably, at this point, only export about 13%. Um, Alunda, what, yeah. is the, uh, what is the involvement? You mentioned that your grapes are 
uh, contracted or you, you buy the grapes. How much involvement in uh, viticulture you have as the cellar master uh, if, or your viticulturist in uh, dictating what, uh, how the vineyards are looked after? And um, also I want to hear about uh, how this wine was made and how long it's been on the lease, for instance, if you can just give us a bit of details about that. Uh, sure. Um, Masha, I'm, I'm very involved with the viticulture on Steenburg site itself. Unfortunately, Robertson, as some of the other guys that are from Robertson know, that it's, um, it's, a, it's quite a drive out to Robertson. But again, I, I want to reiterate that's why it's so important to make sure that you have a close relationship with your grape supplier. So I, I've known our grape supplier for almost 12 years. And so um, we just have an incredible relationship. And because of that long relationship, I think between the two of us, we discuss what kind of um, Chardonnay characteristics we get from harvesting from uh, a variety of different blocks off more than one of his um, properties available to us to where we can go and buy a Chardonnay. So um, it's, he makes it easy for the rest of us. <laughs> and there are quite a few of us who like to buy little pockets from the specific producer in Robertson. Um, so, but it, it again, um, it comes down to the relationship, most definitely. Yeah. And uh, vinification, I, I understand that uh, you um, just over a year in Stinberg, but uh, is uh, is something that uh, been done for some time? The same uh, way to vinify this Chardonnay, or is that something that uh, you're going to modify? Tell us a little bit about this Chardonnay's vinification, please. Yes. Uh, can I check, Moshe? Can you guys see my, my screen, my fact sheet? Not yet. Okay. Um, let me just check. You may have to click stop share and then re-click share. That's it. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's the, yeah. You can see that now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's very basic. Um, this is according to Cup Classic Association recommendations. So early hand harvesting, cool grapes arriving as early as possible, first thing on the, um, on the uh, facility. We do a whole bunch pressing. We try and stick to Stienberg tries to stick to the Cuvée recommendation as, um, as Champagne recommends it. So only the best Cuvée juice that free, free runs from, from the press gets used in, in our final blend. Um, you'll see the sugar levels between 17 and 19 degrees bulling. Um, and uh, again, as with most Blanc de Blancs and most Method Champenois styles, with the Chardonnay, it's about um, soft extraction, low phenols, high natural acidity, and um, just embracing everything that's beautiful on about Chardonnay in the bottle. Um, even before I joined the Stienberg team, this brand has always been beautiful and aspirational. I think the you would recognize some other champagne brands who also like to use yellow labels. I think maybe we like to think that we're the yellow label from, from Cup Classiques. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, widely recognized and, and hugely loved and enjoyed Blanc de Blanc. Excellent, excellent. Um, I think, um, Alunda, if, if there's any uh, other points you want to, uh, or points you want to make, uh, let us uh, know uh, about any other wines you planning to make or uh, the, the stage is still yours before we move uh, to uh, uh, Tak Wan and uh, we, um, uh, if you can, uh, so Alinda, can we finish with that? Sure, sure. Yes. Excellent, uh -huh. thank you very much. The wine is excellent and 
yes, I, um, I, I'm looking forward to taste uh, uh, other wines from your range. So swiftly to Takwan if he's uh, there and I'll unmute him because he's still on mute. Sorry, Moshe, can I just say that I'm of finding, course. I'm tasting this wine this evening and I'm finding it to be incredibly rich. It's mm. really beautifully rich and with um, a wonderful palate weight and a very long finish that is actually driven by that palate weight. So it's drinking really beautifully. Yeah, I, I think we had a previous conversation where Peter mentioned this and I'd love to reiterate on it, is that we're saying um, there are lots of negatives uh, regarding COVID. But I think um, if you're a Cup Classic producer, you have to agree that a little extended time on lease has never hurt any beautiful Cup Classiques. So um, I think the Cup Classiques after the alcohol ban are going to be enjoyed and be matured even more beautifully than ever before. So a little bit more time on lease is never a bad thing. Thank you. Thank you. Takwan, I'm uh, trying uh, relentlessly to unmute you, but it's, uh, it's not working. <laughs> it's, there you go. Now you've done it yourself. Oh, no. And you just click it again. That's what your way does. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, excellent, loud and clear. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think I have to. I have to get myself a new bottle. Um, first of <laughs> all, I'd like to just. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the first uh, two speakers and yourself, Moshe, uh, and Kathy for for this evening. Um, <laughs> there we go, Pierre Jordan, Brut. Um, for for this evening, it's 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 very exciting. Um, getting back to, uh, I thought I wouldn't go into too much detail and slides. Uh, the two professionals I'd I'd hate to challenge, and I think they've fulfilled those geographic and historical points. I'll just get back to a little bit to the uh, Old Cabrier side and uh, the humble beginnings of Pierre Jordan. Um, Peter has mentioned, and I like to just thank all the information he's brought aboard and what he does for the Cape Classic. But uh, Peter has mentioned uh, how, you know, next year is going to be 50 years of uh, Cape Classic and um, the, the history of it and starting in 71. Um, and our history, uh, Pierre Jordan, um, interesting enough, my father at the time was working at Boschendal and was inspired by uh, Simon Sucht for producing the first uh, sparkling wine or cap classic in those days uh, and was the second cellar master to, to attempt and to enjoy producing this magical drink. Uh, he was still working at Boschendal. He was an employee, he was a cellar master, uh, quite a bit of a pioneer to the wine industry. And uh, he saw the opportunity of what we know today is Cactusic, uh, as something for him to start off with, because um, he had nothing. He had nothing. He had, didn't have a wine farm. He didn't have anything. He was passionate about wine, and he thought if he had to really start in his career, that he needed something different and real, uh, and no true competitors, meaning more than more than one, uh, and that's why he uh, broke away. And interesting enough. Um, Peter was uh, one of our first uh, great members at uh, Close Cabrera or Cabrera today. Worked very closely for my father with years and was actually basically the third, if I'm getting this correctly, the part of the third team that was producing uh, what we know today as Cape Classic. Um, so we just focused on uh, producing uh, this beautiful wine and um, here we are today. Um, we still only today focus on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. I mean, we re respect. I know your question came up earlier about using different cultivars in South Africa, um, but I think when you start off with something as precious as Champagne, and um, you want to get it right, you, you start off on the gr ground rules, and um, they're grafted. 
you know, their weather conditions, Chardonnay and Pinot worked the best for them. However, I think in South Africa and the Cape Classic Association, we've also realized that they are truly, if you look at Chardonnay and Pinot, the two main stable grape varieties that really work for this style of wine, this uh, sparkling wine that we, we are producing. Um, and we have, we have great pleasure in producing that. Uh, I'm the second generation uh, running the farm with a, with a great team. Um, we are based in Franschhoek. And currently, yes, we are also part of a, a group that uh, do source and get great uh, quality uh, juices and grapes from Robertson. Um, however, we have got a different or a, a special product that we are actually focusing to bring that back home to, to Franschhoek. But the wine we're enjoying tonight is our Pierre Jordan Brut. Um, I was delighted that you uh, really tasted it earlier today you, because you had a question uh, um, and um, I'm pleased and I hope the wine has evolved um, because it's, um, you know, the last time I was in the Champagne, someone said to us, you know, every minute that you get back to a glass of Champagne, there's a difference. Um, so we must also see it's not, you know, just something fancy and bubbly in a glass and to celebrate. It's also alive. You know, it's, it's such an interesting category of how do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy it extremely fresh? Do you enjoy it, um, you know, a longer time on the lees? Um, cook maturation. Uh, there's so many exciting elements to, to Method Classic and Champagne that we're only understanding now and, and we're allowed to play with. Because if you look at it, it is actually extremely restrictive. I mean, in, in the Champagne itself, even more. And in South Africa, and I think it is important to have these, these rules. That rules sound harsh, but I think more these like kind of these guiding steps to actually produce great quality and uh, in totality uh, uh, have a, a product that is, is respected. Akwan, you mentioned, uh, I know it's, uh, it's something that uh, will be new to a lot of people, but uh, the cork maturation, can you tell us how that makes a difference before I uh, move to a bit more uh, personal well, about you? The, the cork maturation, I think um, we, can, we can definitely bring in Peter into that as, as a little bit later because he's playing around also with the graph. But it's definitely the relaxation and the expression also of the, of the mousse, mousse on your palate. And, um, and also we, there, there's been factors of, uh, you know, cork being natural. It's also like a wood product, uh, mild integration of, of tannins um, that also help to fill and round off the wine. Remember, the Champagne, the style of Champagne was actually forced about, upon cellar masters. It wasn't the region, if you had to ask anyone, I mean, like you mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, they're focusing more on Bordeaux style wines. I mean, if, if the Champagne had a choice of having more sun, they would go for that. So they have come up with a technical way of almost taming a wine to be palatable, fighting against acidity, fighting against volumes, um, so far more tech, technical than most other wines, which are actually more terroir driven. Today, I mean, the last time we were at Vitif, uh, Peter, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's a, really the first time that we're actually not only about champagne, but inside their own boundaries, talking about terroir and blocks, which was, was not really that, that apparent. It was, okay, it's a region and it protected itself and it's called itself champagne. But they had to fight very hard to produce something that was palatable because of the harsh conditions um, and fighting against acidity and not getting wines with alcohol. So they've been the master of being able to, to push the craftsmanship in cellars to the limits, maybe maturing in French oak, uh, stainless steel, um, using cork as uh, you know, uh, this a graph system, uh, to actually bring in a little bit more structure into wines that could be quite lean and actually quite weak. So there's an amazing science behind this 
this beautiful wine. And really, I think of all wines uh, uh, challenges one's abilities. So with the cork side, it's just really just allowing the wine to to mature, um, allowing the 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 mousse, the pressure of the CO2 to, to really integrate itself into the through the liquid and get as much substance as possible yet again with the fine uh, with the fine co2 or the mousse uh, giving you this wonderful i always say drinking champagne is like jumping onto a cloud it's your decision when you want to hop off <laughs> excellent excellent so uh, the um just uh, before you present the wine i just want to hear uh, because you said you're second generation and uh, it's interesting to hear uh, what kind of uh, path led you to um, uh, fall in love with the sparkling wine. I know that uh, it already existed, but I think as we um, already uh, heard from Peter and from yourself as well, the growth of MCC is, is fairly recent. So what what kind of inspiration where, where did you draw your inspiration to uh, produce uh, as best an mcc as you can well i mean to be brutally honest uh, i come from a if you look at it if you, even if you go back to europe um agriculture and farming uh your children and your family and your your wife are the first form of first form of employment and staff um so yeah, there wasn't there wasn't much of a choice. However, uh, the, the excitement, the the passion, the the ability to share, the learning, the the networking, the, that very quickly became apparent uh, to me and to 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 learn. I'm I'm more of a practical person. I'm uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm theoretically brilliant. I just I just love and the ability of wine and just grasping just as even this conversation we're having this this evening i've made a thousand little notes i probably can't read it afterwards because i'm dyslexic so i'm delighted i didn't have to type anything this evening but just the energy you feed from it and going to the place like champagne or then you know uh, having a glass of wine with peter or the rest of the group and tasting different things and discussing it um really just kind of fueled fueled the um, the pa pa passion of producing great wines and let it own uh, Cape Classic. And look, my father started with nothing. He walked into a bank and he said, I bought a farm. And the bank manager said, with what? He said, that's why I was, that's why I'm here. And then he went to the next bank and then came back again and convinced the bank that, well, it was Standard Bank, that the previous bank had given him a deal and he wanted a better deal. And then he had the audacity and the craziness to start off with MCC now, or Cape Classic as we call it now, where people only drank it on, on, on special occasions, birthday, Christmas, New Year's, or after successful divorce. So, I mean, we, Oort Cabrio has really been part of the whole journey of uh, the evolution of Cape Classic, and it's becoming stronger and stronger, and mainly because we have been, you know, so regiment, and we've created a structure of this Cape Classic Association with a great German like Peter and tasting wines together and making decisions and going forward and, in, and listening to one another. Uh, it's been so important and it's actually just strengthening the whole, the whole, uh, the whole industry and the character of it. Fantastic. That is, uh, that is uh, the kind of uh, speech that uh, will uh, drive uh, an army forward. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I just uh, uh, want to um, go back to uh, the actual wine that we have in the glass, or some of us. Kathy said, if you don't have it, imagine you have it. I encourage people days uh, leading to the, towards this uh, session to have any MCC that they can get hold of. But uh, for the lucky ones that have the uh, uh, Brut, tell us what, what's in it and um, how it's made. And then Kathy might tell Can us. Can I make uh, a quick phone? Yes. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. You, I'm joking. Cannot phone, you cannot phone a friend, but you could ask the audience. No, no, I'm, I was just, just bring, you know, typically bringing a sense of humor in. Um, I was, uh, you know, I see Hammond in the background, so I was just going to give him a call. Um, no, um, no, the Pierce Jean Brut is, uh, it's an 80% Chardonnay, 20% Pinot Noir blend. 
Um, my passion, if I may say so, and I think it's very important, especially if you've got an icon of a father like I have, uh, the most important thing is, you know, don't try and step into that footstep or the shadow individually. Um, I, I truly, really love Chardonnays in, in the Champagne and in MCC. Um, so for, for me, um, I must admit, you know, everyone is scared of change and what have you changed when you've done? I have, I have upped the presence of Chardonnay in our Cape Classic. Sorry, Peter, I'm getting used to the, you know, we, we now are Cape Classic. Um, I, I have upped the Chardonnay in the Cape Classic. I just love the elegance, and the drive it's got and the potential it's got. Uh, Moshe, I mentioned to you earlier that I've even played around of keeping some leaves on for 10 years. Um, but the, the brute at the moment is about 80% Chardonnay. There's a lovely freshness to it, a little bit of brioche, uh, because bear in mind, this is just 12 months, which we believe in, which we're going for. So about, uh, and, and then in the background, the Pinot Noir, and I know this out of experience, it's a bit of a nuisance waiting that long, but as the wine evolves, the Pinot Noir becomes a little bit more apparent. But at the moment, it's like a little red forest berry in the Jack, when you you just uh, broken up. I don't know if uh, you all heard. Just if you can repeat the the description of the um, how the uh, Pinot Noir uh, uh, develops. So, so what what I was saying is, um, first of all, it's brilliant. Um, it's only no. Uh, so the Pinot Noir, if you've got enough patience, is. In, at, at the moment, it's almost like a little red forest berry in the background that tickles your imagination on the back of your palate. And as it evolves, you know, time and um, the only problem with, with COVID is that, you know, you, you look at your cellar twice. But w when the wine evolves, the, the, the richness and the, the depth of Pinot Noir starts to come through more and more. But in the, at the moment, it is really just a hint of a freshness in the background. I want you to enjoy the freshness of the, the Chardonnay, the, the almost fresh baguette, not, not when you break it, not smelling the, the crust, but as you break it, more the, the freshness of the core of the baguette than the, 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 the crust um, of brioche, so very light, um, and a, a hint of goldenness, and in the background, you've got this little, little forest berry that will get everyone excited. I'm excited. You told me earlier today about your um, uh, Chardonnay that you kept for 10 years. Uh, is that deliberate or completely um, experimental? No, no. It, look, it was a bit of both. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I also had, uh, you know, we had students that worked for us in the, at Old Cabrio. And uh, one or two came from Cote Blanc and Le Menil. And I mean, if it's like you die and go to heaven and you taste those amazing Chardonnays. Um, so uh, my efficiency and my, my drive for Chardonnay is, is huge in Cape Classic. And um, my beloved Blanc de Blanc, um, it's uh, currently, it's still partial. It's, it's Franchuk and a bit of Robertson, but from 2016, so we did leave a bit of a gap. Um, it will be just French oak fruit. It is a, it's a blend of 40% Chardonnay and uh, the remainder is in Stannis Hill. And I just wanted to see how far I could push a South African Chardonnay. And um, I, I can honestly just, for everyone that truly loves Chardonnay, um, there's great, there's great potential. There is absolutely amazing potential. And through a bit of luck and maybe a bit of miscommunication, it was probably there a little bit longer. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted about it because I love the raciness, the precision of the acidity in Chardonnay. And if you taste the 2010, you still got that freshness in the background. It's, it's reaching its, its limit. Um, it is really now for, for connoisseurs and understanding where my vision is going, but it's given so much background 
so much uh, confidence that um, I think it, uh, we'll definitely have a lot of fun and a lot of success out of it. When you taste the wine like that, or when you uh, envision where wine like that can go, uh, do you have other regions that you can compare it to or give us some um, a hint of what it's like anywhere in the world, if there is any? Well, I mean, you know, if you compare to, to, to the, the, the Champagne, which is probably the highest uh, that you can ever go from, if coming from Cote de Blanc, and if you look at, um, which we've never done in our cellar, particularly uh, some of the others may have, you know, keeping reserve wines. Um, you know, I, 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 have, I have a huge responsibility of where, from where we come from. And um, uh, I was extremely surprised and very proud of how far we could have actually pushed our South African Chardonnay um, to in, on the edging of, of, of the, of, on the lease. So I think there's great potential and uh, I might play around with, I w say for example, that's been 10. My vision to date would probably be seven uh, with a combination of, of um, in, my, in, in my mind would probably be, if you look at five years lease, um, three years, um, you know, it's lying uh, horizontally in support for the next for two to slow down maturity and then two years on cork. Um, that is what I'm envisioning, and I, and I really believe it's going to be an absolute bomb. Excellent. Um, well, Kathy, I'm just uh, uh, aware that uh, you we, we're one of the only ones that tasted it, so and you're in a position to. Uh, uh, Give us a, a comment about the uh, the wine. So certainly, uh, certainly, Moshe. Just in a, in a nutshell, I have to say that I first tasted these wines must be way back in 1992. How old were you, Takwan, in 1992? And um, Philip and I, <laughs> Philip and I, had um, arrived at the the cellar because we had a. An appointment we were studying for our equivalent of the WSET in South Africa, which is the Cape Wine Academy diploma. And we had an appointment with your father, and he wouldn't come out because he was painting pictures of your mother. And I'm not going to go into any detail about those pictures that he was painting of your mother. No, 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 not on this forum. Not on this forum. Not on this forum. <laughs> anyway, um, your mother did a wonderful tasting for us, and she was the first person to ever subrage for us um, a um, Cabrier wine. And then you were the second person to ever subrage for me. Do you remember we did that show for those rather unappreciative people who were down from Africa for their conference um, of, of a Chinese electronics goods and you had to let the CEO subrage on the stage and he messed it up horribly and they didn't manage to clean it up and I had to then tiptoe around this mess of um, your wine all around the evening while I was trying to introduce the red wines and they weren't listening to me. And then just last year, your father eventually got to Sabrage for me. So it's been a long time in, in coming. Um, and he gave me a painting, not of your mother, <laughs> but he did give me a painting of some flowers um, when I last saw him. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, he is one of the true absolute nutters of the South African industry. And I say that with all the love and affection because he keeps us interested and he keeps challenging us. Nothing is sacred. Um, and this wine, um, far, um, I don't want to say fresher because um, the Steenberg is still fresh, far more youthful, far more primary than the Steenberg. I hear exactly what you're saying about the Chardonnay talking to us now, and in fact, it's showing quite aptly. And then, yes, with that hint of um, brioche or French loaf on it. And um, I can't wait to see what happens when the um, little um, Pinot starts exerting its, its force of nature on the wine. But really brisk, really energetic, and a very exciting wine to drink. 
Well, Kathy, uh, that's exactly, that's, you know, if you notice, this is also non-vintage. Um, and that's exactly what I want to express. I want to just get a little bit of a, that sparkle back into Cape Disick. Um, and, you know, there are, and it is quite tricky. You know, I, I've tasted, I remember the last time I was in, um, in uh, Limonil, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, with some friends and uh, great chef and he ran quite a big cup and we tasted with Paul Gerber from um, mm. Comor, great friend of mine, uh, good God, I mean, we drink liters when we get together. Um, we, we had a, a, a dinner where we had uh, a 81 uh, Blanc au Blanc, it, it was slightly on Alledge, um, and there was, when they poured the wine, it was so golden, you could have thought it was a, an amazing akim. And there was one bubble that looked at you. It didn't move. You put the glass down and it was in the same position and it, and it looked at you. And we had um, an amazing rich dish. You can only imagine, and I don't, don't give yourself into trouble, uh, some good liver uh, um, fried up. And it was brilliant. Um, so, you know, it is, it's, when people ask you, it's, it's quite really, you have to kind of understand I made a bold statement once, oh, this would be, to some beautiful ladies, this would be great with oysters. And she said, you know, do you, do you even think I enjoy oysters? This is a champagne festival. So my aim for this beautiful wine is fresh, young, vibrant, gets you excited, gets the dinner going. And then as we've proven over and over again, uh, and Champagne has to fight with it. I mean, this whole COVID, I mean, I just read an article. There's, there's like one billion bottles that haven't left the cellar yet. I, I booked the first flight out straight to the Champagne to go and help them out. I, I'm not going to charge them. Okay. I'm not, I've, I've, I will do my own accommodation. I will, you know, hunt, poach, whatever, and I'll help them drink one billion bottles of Champagne. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to remind people that this is not for a special occasion. This is a wine that you can really enjoy with great foods and uh, it's, it, it's a daily thing. Anyway, I, I, I still think that there are two other characters that have to talk a bit. Uh, you can always come back and ask questions. <laughs> Thank you for enjoying my wines. Um, and if you're lucky, I might even play a note on my, my guitar later. I was like, you know, itching for it while Peter was talking. But yes. uh, thank you. Thank you, Zay. Thank you very much, Takura. Very fa fascinating stories. But uh, Hank is there for over an hour and a half and uh, uh, sitting patiently with the lambs in the vineyard. And it's still daylight and beautiful. <laughs> and uh, we are uh, reaching I love the breeze. Yes, it's, uh, and it's uh, the Paul René Chardonnay. And um, Hank, tell us a little Hi. bit about yourself. I'm glad. Um, hi, much. I'm glad you're on the Chardonnay. I've also got the rosé here with me, but I have been on the Chardonnay most of this evening. Um, I but yeah, I have to. Rose. I have to. That is the rosé. Oh, hi, Kathy. Mm. Um, I'm so <laughs> proud of my sheep there. You know how difficult. If you know a sheep trainer, you know to get them to stand still for that still. long. <laughs> it, you know it hasn't been easy. I'm going to have to reward them, but um, but nevertheless, um, hi everyone. I'm Hank from, from Paul René. We're a small uh, cup of music producer in Robertson. A lot of you have mentioned Robertson and the region and the significance to producing cup of six, specifically Chardonnay grapes, rich limestone soil. Uh, before I forget. Whoops, okay, there we go. Okay, no, no, um, I'm, just, I'm just showing everybody where you are. Just a minute. Um, okay. So, yeah, a bit of the, how did, where did Paul René start? It started in, 2008, so my wife and I moved to a family farm in Robertson, and uh, we had a dream, and um, we started um, uh, producing bubbly. Our first vintage was in 2009. We started with Chardonnay, um, and it was released in 2012. Uh, there was a Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay. It was called Brut. We can talk about that later, um, but it was 100% Chardonnay, and um, Three years after that, we started with the Brut Rosé, which, which is 75% Pinot Noir and 25% Chardonnay. Um, just to show you, I picked this up, it was in the vineyard today earlier, and, and this is really 
Um, a lot of people spoke about Robertson and being a good region for Chardonnay for Cup because this is a piece of limestone rock. You walk around in the vineyard, you trip over it, you pick it up. But um, it's quite common. You don't have to look very far to find this. Um, I think that's one of the re reasons why so many people source their grapes from this region. Um, you get smaller, finer pieces, etc. But um, yeah, it's, uh, the limestone soils here are quite common. Um, so yeah, specifically took that picture today with a sheep in there because um, uh, sustainable farming is it's quite a um, passion of mine. And um, so those sheep are grazing. I mean, I took the photo from the stoop of the patio by our house, and they are grazing in the vineyard in front of our house with Pinot Noir, and they get to eat whatever's green there. So um, uh, it's something we're trying now. A few people are doing it, and uh, I'm excited about that. Um, and uh, are we going to taste the drink now? Yes, if you if you may tell us a, a little bit. Of, I think we can touch on both wines. Um, by the way, I should have mentioned <laughs> the introduction. We normally aim for an hour, hour and a half. We already had an hour and a half. I hope that you're all uh, still engaged and really keen to hear more because it's a lovely conversation. I don't like to uh, uh, put. A, a, it's it's very rare that I have four wine uh, makers. Uh, in a session, and a master of wine, and so many of you uh, in audience. So stay with us. And Hank, yes, take your time. We are. I'm tasting here the Chardonnay. But if you want to tell us uh, all the uh, information about the Chardonnay, uh, feel free. And then about your rosé as well. This is a gorgeous. Okay, rosé. so um, it's uh, it's all Robertson fruit. So we are in Robertson. You can, if you want to go to the map, I can show you, you can talk through the map. If you want to go back to the map. Um, but all our grapes are handpicked. Um, so we would pick from three or four vineyards. Um, the furthest one is six kilometers from the cellar. The nearest one is 700 meters from the cellar. So um, it, is, it is much easier for us to get the wines, um, the grapes into the cellar. Um, so, this yeah. is where the winery yeah. and the cellar is. Okay. Um, I'm sharing it, so you cannot point uh, on the to the map, but uh, I think we can see the farm here. Yes. And uh, so in front, the sheep are grazing in front of the house. Uh, but if you go over the river, that is where we planted um, Chardonnay. So that's that's been on at the top left. Um, if you go over the river, you'll find some. Um, there we go. That mm. big, big block, that is Chardonnay. So that is called the Oliva Farm. So we would normally um, pick from there, from that um, vineyard. And if you go a little bit further down, you see that small triangle at the bottom. This one? We'll go further down. Uh, at the top now. Yes, that, that, so that, that's Pinot Noir. So that, that's planted southeasterly. So that's on the southeasterly slope. So um, a little bit of morning sun, but no low, real sun in the afternoon. And it also facing directly into the southeasterly breeze that we get in Robertson, that is quite unique. Um, it is not a cool area, but we get a, um, in summer daily, we get a nice cool afternoon southeasterly breeze um, every day, like clockwork between four or five o'clock until seven or eight, cool breeze from the southern tip of Africa, so that cools down the area, it's very unique to our area, and, um, and, and that helps a lot. Um, it is 163, by the way, when I hover on everywhere, you can see at the bottom uh, right hand side of the screen, the elevation above sea level, so it shows us that it's 163 meters above sea level. And, so uh, the river more or less, the river is about 150, so whenever you're close to the river you're about 150 meters. So we have got more elevated areas as well, but we normally pick from three or four of our own vineyards. It's all our own vines. So, you know, the viticultural side, we, we manage 100%. So I spend a lot of time in the vineyard and it's a, um, also a big passion for me. So um, we get to manage, um, you know, the farming and the farming production 100%. Um, Excellent. And, and just 
a little bit about the, the wine itself. What, what do you like to do? Is it 100% Chardonnay? It is 100% Chardonnay. It was, you know, when we started, we had ideas of what should we do. So, you know, the, you know it, as we, we've all mentioned, our great area is for Chardonnay. So that was a bit of a slam dunk for us to start off with Chardonnay. I mean, to produce good Chardonnay in Robertson is almost, so it's like finding a good pub in England. It's, it's really easy, you know. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of good Chardonnay in the area. So um, also, I mean, I, from the beginning, like the style of the Blanc de Blanc. So that for me was my favorite in starting. So, um, uh, yeah, so. How long has it been? Our first vintage, because we, we always handpicked. The first vintage, we cooled the grapes in the cold room beforehand. We did a lot of, but now we, 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 we don't do that anymore. We, but we do a whole bunch of press and, and, and spend a lot of time in sorting the grapes. So we've got time to do that because it takes us five minutes to drive the grapes from from the vineyard to the to the cellar. So, um, what is what is what is the lease aging uh, regime here? How so um, normally not less than twenty four months. Never been less than twenty four months, but it has. But now, as a few people have mentioned about COVID, um, and Peter mentioned earlier about the possible two tier system in Cup of Six. So we are now our, our next engorgement. So we're drinking now two thousand sixteen. Um, so our next engorgement are 2017. Yeah, boy, yeah. Our 2017 will be 36 months on the lease. So that is one significant change to our style going forward. It has always been a minimum of 24 months, and that's what you are tasting now. But we've managed over time, we've always planned to, um, to try and increase our lease time, uh, uh, our lease period over time. But we've never had the stock to do so. We're a small producer, and, and, and but we have managed to increase our production. And and if ever there is going to be a premier class in the Cup of Six, we Coronet definitely wants to be in the category. So this is what you're tasting now is 24 months, but our next engorgement and going forward will be will be uh, 36 months. And what do you do with your rosé? I tasted a few days ago your rosé, and uh, again it's. Um, um, uh, very uh, um, soft, but um, it has a beautiful weight and beautiful balance. Um, well, we do the same. We, we, we follow in a way the same recipe as with the Chardonnay, but it's seventy-five percent Pinot Noir. So we press that lightly, and um, and we have separate fermentation for our two Pinot Noirs, um, and and. We blend off the fermentation we would blend with 25% Chardonnay. Um, so, um, and then it's also, again, this was 24 months on the lease. Um, and and it's, it's fairly dry for a rosé. It is in the brute category, but it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's fairly dry. So, um, I think Kathy has uh, some of it now. I'm, I'm not sure if she's, uh, that's what she's tasting now, but yeah. It is what I'm tasting. I was absolutely delighted to see some pink in my in my glass, Hank. Um, Hank, it's actually a wine that's making me think quite a lot. Um, because for me, this particular um, glass is not very expressive at the moment on the nose. But um, on the palate, it just keeps unfolding and unfolding and delivering more and more. However, when I say it keeps unfolding and delivering more and more, I don't want you to think of exuberant fruit. It's quite, um, quite tight. Um, and it's certainly showing some elegance. So it's, it's really lovely to actually taste this. And um, yeah, it's just making me think because I keep having to come back to that actual palate weight and texture that I'm getting from the Pinot Noir complement that's in the blend. So that's my commentary on the wine, Moshe. Um, I, I just wanted to ask um, Hank, in terms of his um, sustainable farming methods, aside from having sheep, what else are you doing in Robertson? I mean, I see the farms are quite close to the breeder, but um, you can't just lift up a little steel plate and irrig storm irrigate or water flood irrigate your your vineyards, what other sustainable methods are you putting in place? 
Um, I think it's a, it's a moving target. We try obviously to to use less herbicides over time. You know, you can't just change everything overnight. So that's definitely something we've been doing. You know, we use by using cover crops, etc. I've got my own chickens here at home. I mean, and they uh, supply us with eggs, but um, I suppose that's small small scale farming. But um, I think the many advantages with being able to irrigate. You mentioned the, the river. I think. Um, and, and to add to uh, the region and the advantages that we have here, and we um, being able to irrigate in the summer and being able to manage our, our, our canopies and and our viticulture, and also being more of a of a winter rainfall area helps um, to have healthier grapes and so on. If, if that's not um, answering your question, but we definitely um, we see the advantages of irrigating and having being so close to the river. Um, no, yeah, and, and talking yeah. about that river, your vineyards are quite close. Do you have any problem to the river? Do you have any problems with water table? No, no, no. Not at all. Still no, well no. draining soils. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's good. Oh, and then the other question I had, um, Moshe, but I suppose this might be a, a time for when we speak to people who make um, Pinot Noir, but just a qualification um you have um the pinot noir that you've planted is pinot noir that's suitable for sparkling wines it's not like um pinot noir that's more suitable for red wine production we planted specifically for sparkling wines. okay okay i'll shut up now <laughs> it's okay i think uh, uh hank if if um that is the, uh, we can um, uh, finish. We saw uh, beautiful aerial photos of where you are, very uh, close to actually the town of Robertson and um, near the river. And um, I think the wines are, are gorgeous. And I think you already, by the sound of it, uh, producing wine with uh, uh, extensive uh, lees aging and you uh, gear yourself to possibly the next tier, as Peter uh, mentioned before, when uh, it's uh, introduced, if uh, in future it's introduced. So that uh, brings me to Peter, that is uh, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the chairman of the uh, Cap Classic Producers Association and uh, the uh, uh, best ambassador or the, the most uh, renowned ambassador of uh, Cap Classic in the world. And um, Peter, we have, uh, wine here that is your uh, Blanc de Blanc from uh, 2015. Kathy, am I right? Are we uh, synced on that? Yes, yeah, I, think I, think so. that's, uh, I think that's what you've got. It's uh, 2015 uh... Blanc de Blanc, yeah. yeah. I seem to disappear. Yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah. The bottle is still... Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome to the graveyard session. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Just checking that everybody is awake and things like that. Mm. I, I've really enjoyed it so much listening to my fellow winemakers producing these incredible bubbles. So mine is going to most probably be a little bit more of a picture story and just really summarizing Really, and I know uh, each of those who've spoken tonight shares the same philosophy to it. And uh, obviously, this is a Grainbeck philosophy, which, uh, you know, we've developed over 30 years. Uh, I'm the sort of the founding cellar master at Grainbeck. So I'm still here to tell you and, you know, live, live the story of Grainbeck. And it's most probably better just that I do it with a little slideshow and it will really summarize and most probably uh, answer a lot of questions that has been asked. There's been some fantastic questions, um, uh, but might provoke a little bit more. So uh, bear with me a little bit and uh, I'll keep it short and quite concise and rather take it as question and answer sessions. My motto in life is I'm in search of the perfect bubble. Uh, you would think, uh, and Takwan gave me such nice kudos earlier. Uh, really, it's uh, if it wasn't for Achim, uh, you know, most probably 
to lay the foundations for where I am today, uh, it would have been much more difficult. So uh, I, I spent seven amazing years with uh, Pierre Jordan. And um, then one day uh, I uh, was invited by Graham Beck to come and see a farm in Robertson. And yes, it's uh, a little bit of a legacy that uh, we have developed, but uh, a fascinating story. So uh, one would always ask, is there such a thing as a perfect bubble? Well, in 30 years, I'm getting closer, but I have not smoked a cigar yet. So uh, um, even if it's locked down. But our estate uh, in Robertson, and uh, Moshe has shown it on the map, um, and I'll just point it out may maybe just now. We st the farm was bought in 1983 by Graham Beck. Uh, I joined in 1990, and uh, our maiden vintage was uh, in 91. But we see we due east of Cape Town, a two hour journey. Uh, our farm is just under 4,000 hectares, but we only farm 3,340-odd hectares, so uh, it's conserved. So we, we're proud ourselves about sustainability, that for every one hectare we have, we preserve five hectares. So uh, it's, it's really nice. And um, you've heard so much about Robertson tonight, and I can just reiterate. The three major advantages of this region is a thing called sunshine, the high incidence of natural limestone, and we have the biggest dynal shift in temperature. Dynal shift just means uh, the, the height of temperature at day to one at night. There will be a minimum change of 20 degrees Celsius, so it's quite significant. and. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Chardonnay and Pinot Noir is so conducive for sparkling wine production in Robertson. Uh, we talked about the terroir. Um, Hank showed you the beautiful um, sort of limes and deposits. Um, within there, we have a little bit of red karoo, and this is a soil profile in the background of the sort of red karoo. If you sort of scratch through it, uh, after soil preparations and things like that, you'll actually see the exposed uh, chalk or limestone available for uh, um, the, the vineyards. Um, I talked about the, the huge shift in temperature. We are, we are extremely in low in rainfall. You know, when I arrived in Robertson uh, 30 years ago, we talked about having 250 millimeters of rain, and now in the last uh, 10 years, we are down to less than 180 millimeters of rain. So the Breda River that Hink referred to, and uh, Moshe as well, is really the lifeline. It's sort of the bloodline that keeps everything alive. And it's interesting, earlier I was on a talk about uh, climate change, and uh, we can just be thankful in Robertson that we have the source of the Breda River. It's really vital. And I think uh, with global warming going forward, it will be, become even more and more important how we manage the water from the Breda. Uh, we make use of, uh, I'll show you with another slide, uh, we use satellite imagery to help us with precision verticulture. And... Uh, we grow 70% of our own fruit and the rest we do source from other areas. And uh, there you can see the sort of two main soil structures uh, on our uh, estate. We have the so-called uh, shale. And if you break that shale, you get down to the limestone deposits. And within this, uh, either this composition of limestone or the composition of Coa Bockefeld, obviously there is a little bit of red karoo soil as well. Sorry, Peter, can I just ask a question for clarification there? So if you say if you break through the Bockefeld, you get through to the limestone. So it's duplex. The one is above the other. Yeah, a lot of... And a lot it of, will be mixed. A, a lot of the soils have got an A, B and C order. So uh, okay. it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely complex. You have to break through a few banks, uh, you know, but once you've got there, you've got the exposure to that. 
And we know, uh, depending on how the shale lie, whether it lies horizontal or slightly vertic more vertical, uh, the root penetration becomes just so much easier. Yeah. So that is all determined by soil preparations uh, when we do soil preparations. But just again, uh, Robertson lying on a continental shelf, um, but the other portions of uh, vineyards that we have, similar to the philosophy of uh, Steenberg. We have long-term arrangements with other growers with close proximity to the Indian Ocean, also even up towards Darling. And obviously all of these fruits uh, comes as grapes to the winery for vinification in, at Kreimbeck. This is just really to reiterate that, uh, you know, uh, every spot in the Western Cape, now, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but all the red little plots, you can see all over, even in a place like Robertson, we have uh, extreme low temperatures in in, 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 in February, this is the average mean temperature, which means it's between 17 and 19 degrees. So I think verticulturally, you know, that is our challenge is to find these cold pockets. Obviously, Elgin, Elgin has got much more. You've got the Elam and Walker Bay and all of these. But we just want to say that uh, besides the sunshine, we also have cooler, cooler spots. Yes, it's a, I think something we mentioned a few days ago, uh, Peter, when we spoke about the, the fact that a lot of people might think of uh, South Africa generally as a, as a hot country and how does it um, adjust or how, how is it suitable for a production of quality uh, sparkling wines. But you just mentioned there the uh, fact that and we mentioned actually in, in uh, sessions prior to this, about when we spoke about Stellenbosch as well, we, we spoke about different grapes and different uh, wines produced. And we could see that actually it's not universally a hot country. There's a lot of cool climate and cool pockets. Absolutely. But one thing we have to understand, we are not chasing, we're not chasing ripeness. We are chasing the sun. And once you have that, understanding you can you can really manage uh, grapes in a warm area and so you can in the complete opposite manage of grapes in a cold area so uh, it's really about it we have su sufficient sunlight hours even in the coldest region that's why we can produce such consistent good good uh, grapes for vinification Excellent. I'm just conscious of time, Peter. So yeah. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to really just run through. This is what I'm trying to say. All our vineyards are plotted by satellite imagery. And if we just take one block out of these, you get something like that. And this just verticulturally tells us where we have extreme vigor in the same block of vineyards and where we have some stress-related stress fact factors. And the whole thing about precision verticulture is to try and get this block looking much more uniform, that we don't sit with five different color variations, but we sit with two. So it's, it's another discussion. So uh, it's, all, it's, all, it's all the mature trees there near the farm that uh, <laughs> stress the, it's, uh, uh, compete with the, with the vines for the water maybe. No, well, that is one thing. So, you know, you know, already I can tell you the, these line of trees have already been removed, you know, because they take too much water and because water has become far more of a, of a sort of lifeline, it is important to, to actually remove, uh, you know, some of that. So you're 100% right, yeah. It is, it is uh, fascinating. I know that we're reaching nearly two hours now into the session, but the global warming is such a, a fascinating and important issue. And, uh, but we have to choose what we, I mean, it's, 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 uh, there's so many things we can talk about. Uh, so we we park that for another day. How's yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I want to. We're not going to. 
We're not going to take you through the process. I think the, the next few slides before we get to the wine will explain it. The whole bunch, why we handle whole bunches uh, for Cup Classique is that we want to regulate the fractional recovery between the quality fraction and the press fraction. So uh, if you squeeze a Pinot Noir grape, it starts white and only when the split, uh, the skin is split, you get a little bit of color. So uh, you can uh, uh, decide where you want to separate the quality fraction from the press fraction. Uh, a typical example is uh, Chardonnay before pressing and Chardonnay after pressing whole bunch. Uh, it's a very gentle uh, pressure that is applied in a pneumatic press. We have different press programs. I'm not going to touch on that, but we have a different program for Chardonnay. We have a different program for Pinot Noir. And uh, we can separate the cuvee fraction from the press fraction. There you can see on the Chardonnay, the one on the left is uh, the cuvee and the press fraction is separate. We keep them separate till after fermentation when we decide as a team whether we blend the two together or we keep it separately for uh, blending opportunities. Pinot Noir is exactly the same. The shorter contact during the pressing time, you have less color. You actually will end up with a white color uh, between these two wines. They will be fairly white after fermentation and you'll have a little bit of uh, color residue which is ideal for uh, if you are producing a rosé, for instance. We have uh, different fermentation vessels. This is our playground. We have some ceramic. We have some amphora. We have some uh, foudre. We have uh, barrels from champagne. So uh, we have some great fun during harvest. Blending is a very important part for the consistency of the Grainbeck style. Um, I'm not going to touch on that, but um, we have the opportunity on our uh, non-vintages to bring in perpetual reserve, which means it's just a collection of older wines that we keep as a single unit, and uh, we blend it in for consistency. And then uh, our least contact time uh, on the wine uh, as we mentioned, uh, currently it's nine months, it's moving to 12 months. And at Grainbeck, we have a prestige cuvee that is five years or 60 months. Our vintages, which is the wine I'm going to talk about now, is uh, minimum four years on the lease. And our non-vintage collection is minimum 15 months. As Takwan has also mentioned and various others, due to COVID, uh, the consumer is going to have an added benefit with uh, wines uh, enjoying at least three or four months extra lease contact time now. And uh, it's just a step in the right direction. Excellent. So we, talked, we talked about the sugar levels, but it's over there. And this is just our portfolio. And we're actually going to talk about the Blanc de Blanc, which is over there. So um, that's where I'm going to stop now, Moshe, because uh, the rest is uh, really, it's maybe for another opportunity you've seen and we've talked about it, is our little bit of research that we do. And obviously, this type of information we do feed through to uh, the association, you know, as it becomes available. So again, it's a, um, thank you, a fantastic presentation. It's a, a presentation that I think, uh, Everybody will share with me the sentiment that uh, it has in, its, in itself, uh, it's a, a mini symposium. We can, uh, we can talk about every slide there for, and, and hear from you the, uh, the explanation um, and the uh, science behind it uh, for some time. Unfortunately, we might have to have another session just about uh, the uh, science behind uh, 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 Cap Classic, and uh, but the Blanc de Blanc uh, 15, which I have in the glass. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, there you have the Blanc de Blanc, it's uh, 2015. Uh, 2015 was an incredible year in uh, the Cape. Uh, uh, I can speak for red wine, I can speak for white wine, and uh, wow, the, 
the bubblies have just been really amazing. Um, uh, the Blanc de Blanc obviously is 100% Chardonnay. 50% of the volume for the Blanc de Blanc is actually fermented in barrel. Now, as soon as one mentions barrels and sparkling, you think you're going to taste this overtly oaky aromatic, but we're using completely a neutral oak. We have 15 new barrels coming in in the year, and we have the 15 old barrels leaving the cellar. But the time we keep a barrel is well up to 20 years in, uh, in the cellar in the process, as long as the barrel remains healthy. So the average age of oak that ends up in uh, our Blanc de Blanc is uh, seven or eight years. So 50% of that will be barrel fermented. And then we will, uh, after the barrel fermentation, we will uh, select our oak portions and we will blend it with what we have in, in tank, in stainless steel. And four years on the lease, Another, another important part is uh, if you look at the back label, this is where, if you look at the back label, you can clearly, well, there you can see the date of disgorging uh, on the back label. So uh, you can see in front that it's got a vintage and uh, the date of disgorging there is May 2019. So, uh, Mine is, mine is July. Yours is in July, yeah. <laughs> we, normally, we normally will uh, discourse our vintages over a three or four batch series um, as, as it becomes necessary to keep stock. Excellent. The, um, again, this wine, uh, you said 48 or um, 60 months on the lease. Um, Great complexity. The um, um, I think the um, Kathy can uh, maybe uh, chime in into the um, uh, weight of the wine and the um, development of it. I don't know when uh, he, the 2015 was first released. Obviously, this one is July 19, so I think it's probably uh, been. Uh, into the market only since Christmas or uh, so to, but uh, it's, uh, I don't know if you do it gradually. The, the okay, yeah, uh, I'll quickly explain. On our, on our vintage, we have a philosophy that we will keep the wine after disgorging for three months. So uh, you would have had uh, the first disgorging, but the wine was only released in September last year oh. for the first time. Um, and uh, you know, and since since then, uh, you know, we've had three different discoursings. That's why you would might sit with, uh, which is your one you talked of? Mine is July and uh, Kathy's, I okay. think, is May. Hey. So that must be yeah. the first one, right? May was the first one and it was released in September. So that's where we get roughly to, uh, four to six months prior to uh, release. Peter, can you, can you tell us uh, how, you do, how would you describe the wine? Well, uh, I think uh, we, have, uh, we have the beautiful Robertson aromatics because this is uh, fruit from uh, the estate. Um, Chardonnay bodes extremely well in the Robertson area. Um, and um, I think there's a little bit of uh, lemons and limes. Um, as an initial uh, tone on the, on, on the nose, and then uh, a little bit more ripe citrus, and then on the palate, you get that beautiful brioche notes coming from four years on the leaves. I think there's a beautiful creamy texture, which I believe that does come from uh, the yeast contact time and uh, from the barrel itself. And Peter, there's, there's also for me um, almost an umami character on the nose. This is, um, there's definitely fruit there, but the fruit has got a, a savory element to it as well. Um, 
and I think that might be part of the evolution, but it's certainly very, very attractive. Um, yeah, a little bit cries of the, out for oysters. <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, you know, that is, that's another fascinating thing is the effect of time on the lease. Uh, Takwan talked about their 10, 10 year program. And, you know, just for nostalgic purposes, you know, just the, uh, just last week, we had a visitor to Robertson and we actually opened a wine that is still on the lease for 30 years and it wasn't dead. So, uh, you know, it's really amazing. But I think with that little bit of oaking, uh, the oaking definitely brings a little bit of umami aromatics. Uh, Kathy, you're 100% right. Um, but then obviously, you know, uh, with that, you can feel the little bit of uh, nervous tension and obviously, you know, oysters won't be a bad choice. I didn't have dinner before we started, but anyway. Um, Peter, I do have so many more questions for you and I know that um, there's a lot of Chinese students who are very keen to watch the recording of this when we've done. Um, it's going to be prescribed for anybody who's studying at Dragon School of, um, mm -hmm. of Wine. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, what is the benefit of aging um, Sir Point as opposed to aging Sir Lee horizontally? Well, that's, uh, we've, we, uh, we only, we only, f you know, we, Seeing we sort of a specialist of it, you know, we, we uh, you know, quite recently because, you know, Grainbeck also had store wines in their past. Um, and it's only really the last four or five years that we've really only concentrated and only doing bubbly. The amount of research and development we're doing is, is really phenomenal. Um, and hopefully I've behaved myself that Moshi will, uh, invite me again that we can speak about all these things but one of them is what we're following at the moment is at bottling when we do the tirage bottling and the tirage bottling means taking the sugared wine adding the yeast putting the crown cap on and what we do immediately we take 30 bottles and we put it lying horizontal so uh, we have the bottle lying like that if if yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have uh, 30 bottles standing upright like this. And we have 30 bottles sur point, where the bottle lies upside down immediately. I happened to see this many years ago when I had traveled through California and I visit Corbel. And um, when they do their tirage bottling, they immediately went into an upside down position because they didn't want to invest into riddling, uh, riddling machines and okay. things like that. Um, and I, I will be able to, closer towards December, give you my first report on the effect of fermenting horizontally, upright or upside down. So uh, watch this space, we're learning we're learning as we speak. There has to be a difference because the surface area is really important and the thinner layer of lees you have in contact with the wine, the more the wine or the yeast can impart flavors back into the wine. It's all, it's all fascinating. I think uh, the amount of experimentation that uh, a winemaker can, uh, can do with um, bottle fermentation, uh, secondary fermentation in the bottle is, uh, is probably the most fascinating in, in anywhere in, 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 the, um, in a winemaking world. Um, and you, you know, can- Yeah, sorry Moshi, not to interrupt, but it, it, it's the same, you know, when, when, when uh, screw caps was developed for still wine, nothing really happened. You know, there was this phenomena of this wine stayed fresh forever. And they've developed uh, screw caps now that allows a certain amount of uh, oxy oxygenation or oxygen transmission to happen. 
so the wine can mature over time. So uh, it's the same sparkling wine. We're already there. We have different crown caps that can do the same things. Amazing. Well, Kathy, we 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 had Relax. so many. We have we had many. Uh, yes, we had many points that you wanted to touch on, like. Uh, best stories of introducing maybe Peter more than anybody else introducing a uh, cup classic around the world anecdotes etc and uh, I'm always interested to hear uh, stories about how quality sparkling wine producers uh, what kind of uh, reception they get when they show their wine to the champenois uh, what happened when they show their wines around the world uh, Peter, if you have a quick anecdote, please give it to us because I don't want to skip that. I know that we're going over two hours now, but uh, tell us because you're producing excellent, all of you, you produce fantastic, uh, fascinating uh, wines that are fairly new to the world. I know that you pointing at over 30 years of history, well, nearly 50 years, next year will be 50 years, but uh, to the world is, is fairly new. And um, how do they go down when you show something as good as this? Uh, well, yo, I, I, I'd like my fellow uh, winemakers to support me on this because I, I think uh, there's many anecdotes that you do. I'm, I'm, I'm of a, oh, in a very fortunate position that I actually do produce sparkling wine, bottle fermented sparkling wine in America. I'm doing it in the UK as well. And wherever we go, you know, we talk and love our product that we take with us. And uh, I'm really happy to, to report that uh, they are really received favorably. Uh, they are starting to recognize it. I still think we need to uplift once South Africa can uh, export at least 30% Cap Classic into the world markets, we will have better presence. It's a, it's a lonely battle in a lot of markets for our individual brands that we represent tonight. But uh, they take con cognizance of that. And the most beautiful story, one touched on it much earlier, Every two years, there's a technical conference in Champagne, and we invited to bring our uh, sort of uh, Cup Classics to an international tasting night. And one of the most popular tables of the evening remains South Africa. So uh, I, I love and fly the flag anytime. Excellent. And uh, I... Kathy, I think we need to wrap it up. It's been fascinating and long. And you had a long day of uh, receiving different deliveries. And I don't know if you had any tastings going on yet. But uh, it's, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, uh, session. We could have, I'm sure, filled another hour with uh, talking about Club, Club Plus 6 and anecdotes and where you see Club Plus 6 in the future. Uh, because all this is still here on my page and uh, left uh, undiscussed. But um, I want to thank you, everybody. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely a, 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 a style of wine that uh, need to be explored, need to be recognized for its excellence. The passion and the dedication that you all put into it is not uh, going unnoticed. And uh, you, um, I want to strengthen your hands because you going through a challenging time with uh, what's going on with your unique uh, um, restriction. We all have restrictions, but you have a quite unique restriction. And before we started this session between us, we were talking about whether we will talk about COVID and uh, you can't skip it, but um, I think we all uh, going to leave that for now and leave, it, uh, leave this session with a positive note. And we have many positive notes when it's come to Cup Classic. So thank you. I will discuss with Kathy when we analyze the chat, uh, which I'll print, it's been a long chat, but I'll print out uh, later on uh, and we'll select 
a, a UK or South Africa, I didn't say that at the beginning, but it has to be UK or South Africa based uh, a participant that will uh, um, find and we will track you down. You don't need to write your email down and you will get a nice box of uh, mixed uh, MCCs. So thank you everybody. This session is recorded so uh, it will be available on uh, www.inthevineyardwith.com and uh, again everybody that participated and everybody that con contributed thank you for the fantastic wines and if we didn't uh, mention a, a specific wine or you thought any of you that we could uh, have touched upon uh, another point I'm, I'm sorry, but it's uh, as you can you see yourself, it's a uh, quarter past nine here in the UK, quarter past ten in uh, in South Africa. Uh, thank you. I'm 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 sure that we'll build uh, on it, and we'll uh, see you again in a future uh, episode. And um, I'm looking forward to see you all in person one day, hopefully. So, uh, Kathy, uh, I know that you muted yourself but you have to unmute yourself to say goodbye. I do. Um, you said that you hope to meet us all in the future as a good Jewish saying, Moshe, from your lips to God's ears. We <laughs> hope to see everybody in South Africa soon. And thank you all for supporting South African wine. Uh, I haven't heard what our president said to us tonight, tonight yet but we're hoping soon to have some good news about coming out of lockdown. Did he speak I've tonight? Seen, uh, tonight or tomorrow? I'm, I don't know. <laughs> nothing, nothing yet. Nothing yet, Hank. Okay. Nope. Nice to see some old friends. It's really wonderful. Sorry, Liz, how's it? Um, Yvonne, everybody, thank you very much for joining. And Stephen, I haven't seen you yet in 20 years. Um, so it's really super that everybody's able to catch up. Thank you for letting me do the walk around. I was trying to show Stephen my new kitchen, um, but um, promises we won't do that. Moshe, I think we need to launch a technical session. There's technical discussions with, and the first one we'll do is with Peter Ferreira. So um, I'll Absolutely. leave you on that happy note. Thank you very much, very much everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.